Okay, we ended last time by writing down the Liouville Arnold criterion for integrability of a Hamiltonian system and I pointed out that when a system is fully integrable, you are supposed to have for an n degree of freedom system n constants of the motion in involution with each other and then the statement was this is necessary and sufficient for you to find a canonical transformation which would to action angle variables after which the problem is in principle solved. Now, what I am going to do now is to give you a number of examples and we apply this criterion and ask is this problem integrable or not integrable and that will decide for us what we should expect in the general case. So, let us start with the simplest of problems. Example 1, a Hamiltonian with 1 degree of freedom h of q given equal to p squared over 2 m plus v of q say for example. So, in this problem n equal to 1, 1 degree of freedom. Is this an integrable system or not? Yes, it is. I know that h of q p is a constant of the motion and n is equal to 1 and I need just one of them. It is of course, an involution with itself and that is it. So, every 1 degree of freedom problem is integrable, is solvable in principle you can always write down the phase trajectories which simply are h of q p equal to constant. Those are the constant energy curves. What about this example 2? With n equal to 2, I have an h of q 1, q 2, p 1 and p 2 and this happens to be in the form h 1 of q 1, p 1 plus h 2 of q 2 p 2. So, it is a 2 degree of freedom system which you could regard as 2 particles for example, moving on an axis, moving on the x axis for instance, but the Hamiltonian happens to be the sum of 2 Hamiltonians, one of which has nothing to do with the other pair of variables and vice versa. Is this an integrable system? Yes, where are the 2 constants of the motion in involution with each other? h 1 and h 2 because it will turn out since q 1 Poisson bracket q 2 is 0, q 1 with p 2 is 0, p 1 with q 2 is 0 and p 1 with p 2 is 0. This set of this function here and that function there are in involution. The Poisson brackets are guaranteed to be 0. So, you are guaranteed that h 1 h 2 is equal to 0. So, you have 2 independent constants of the motion and this is sufficient. It is just like saying I have two separate particles, one of them here and one of them somewhere else and each of them is a 1 degree of freedom system and it is solved completely. What about a generalization to general n? The same thing uh, h of q p equal to a summation i equal to 1 to n h i of q i p i. Is this solvable? Is this integrable? Yes, it is just n uncoupled 1 degree of freedom systems and this is immediately integrable. Where are the n constants of the motion in involution? The different h i's are all in involution with each other and we are guaranteed this is trivial and completely solvable. Of course, you see that there were going to be problems once you have interaction terms where the different q's interact to combine with each other and there are functions which involve q 1 and q 2 and so on then it is a different story. So, all such separable problems are integrable, it is no problem. Now, let us look at some other examples 
of interest let us take a free particle so this is an n equal to 2 case let us take a free particle moving inside a square box in two dimensions now we got constraints and so on so the particles inside the box and let us say this box is some kind of 0 to L for example this is the x direction that is the y direction and that is L and this particle is confined to remain inside this box and it is free it moves on this plane and it is free no forces on it what is the Hamiltonian of this problem. So this is x y and let me just call it px and py this is q1 q2 p1 and p2 just the Cartesian components of the momenta and what is the Hamiltonian it is just kinetic energy there is no potential energy so this is equal to px squared over 2m plus py squared over 2m this is example 3 for instance is this the total Hamiltonian or is there some other term pardon me uh, there is infinite potential outside the box it cannot get out of the box so we are assuming it is in a box with perfectly reflecting walls coefficient of restitution is unity there is elastic collisions with the walls of the box but it is not allowed to go out of the box this is forbidden so those are constraints it says in this problem 0 less than equal to x less than equal to L 0 less than equal to y less than equal to L those are constraints but they are not holonomic constraints they do not decrease the number of degrees of freedom so you leave them as they are and then the problem really has a potential also but then you have to say the potential is 0 inside the box and infinite outside the box so there is a potential v of x comma y and this guy is equal to 0 inside box and infinite outside box now we are interested in the motion inside the box yeah well we are simply saying it cannot go outside that is it so I do not want to have a situation where I have infinity only on a line and maybe it will tunnel through and so on we do not want to do anything this is just infinite outside hmm. now is this an integrable system we are interested in the motion inside the box nothing more than that hmm. so what would happen physically if I started with a particle here and I gave it an initial velocity in the y direction for instance I start from here what would its subsequent path be it would just bounce off and come back it would keep doing this if I start here it would of course go down and bounce and then by the law of reflection it would do this and it would keep going so it can execute fairly complicated trajectories inside depending on what the initial conditions are but the question asked is is this integrable by which I mean if I specify the initial positions and momenta at t equal to 0 can I predict analytically can I write down what the solution is at an arbitrary instant of time no matter how long in the future for this it is necessary and sufficient that you must have two constants of the motion that are in involution with each other are there two such constants uh, p x squared is not a constant of the uh, p x is not a constant of the motion p x is not because as soon as you hit as soon as you hit this wall the vertical wall px is reversed in sign if you hit this wall py is reversed in sign so px and py are not constants of the motion but px squared and py squared are constants of the motion so certainly this is true and they are analytic constants of the motion so we know that px squared is 0 and this is sufficient it is integrable this is of going to be of some interest because you can now change the situation just a little bit and the system will become chaotic completely yeah suppose the Hamiltonian is no longer differentiable then you are in trouble I have assumed that all these are analytic constants of the motion huh? yes excellent in this problem itself the Hamiltonian is not differentiable it is got infinite discontinuities that does not bother us so much the real problem is what happens if I shoot the particle directly into that corner 
what happens now how do I apply the law of reflection. So this problem is said to be pseudo integrable because there are sets of measure 0 initial conditions which are sets of measure 0 for which you cannot write down what the solution is and you assume then for simplicity that anything that hits that corner is absorbed and that is the end of it. So apart from that technicality this problem is solvable it is integrable and so on. Since he does not like the idea of sharp corners let us look at a circle and put the particle inside a circular stadium this is like a carom coin so let us look at example 4 circular these are called stadia this is called a circular stadium and you have a particle inside a circular box and it is confined to stay inside here now the Hamiltonian is still px squared over 2m plus py squared over 2m but what is the is the problem integrable because neither px squared nor py squared is going to be a constant of the motion is this integrable because if you hit this it is going to do that and then it is going to do crazy things. So at each si stage you got to find the normal and then you have to find out what the angle of reflection is and so on. There may be some special trajectories some special initial conditions where this guy will just go through a diameter back and forth or it will go in an equilateral triangle and so on but in general of course for arbitrary initial conditions that is not guaranteed at all is this integrable pardon me yeah we should go to polar coordinates plane polar coordinates huh? then the problem appears to become integrable but what is the other constant of the motion the Hamiltonian is a constant of the motion the energy is, is uh, conserved of course is the distance from the center constant not quite not quite close but not quite so what is constant in this problem let us look at it from first principles this problem has no potential it is a free particle right okay is angular momentum conserved angular momentum about the center is conserved because in this problem the boundary has circular symmetry so the boundary also matters if the potential is 0 inside and infinite on the boundary the boundary has circular symmetry then this problem has circular symmetry you can actually rotate the coordinate axis and nothing will change right so what is the other constant of the motion one of them is h which is px squared plus py squared over 2m that is equal to the total momentum squared over 2m that is a constant of the motion all right what is the other constant of the motion it is the angular momentum about the origin and what is that yeah, p theta but can we write it in Cartesian coordinates since it is a planar problem angular momentum has only one component in two dimensions angular momentum is got only one component it is not a vector there is no z direction it is just x p y minus y p x and that is it now I leave you to check that x p y minus y p x in this problem actually commutes with Poisson commutes with p x squared plus p y squared over 2 m you have two constants of the motion and therefore this problem is solvable. Now he mentioned something about the distance from the center now the angular momentum as you can see the magnitude the speed of this particle is not going to change. So if this is the distance of closest approach then you can actually find the magnitude of the momentum by multiplying this impact factor multiplied by the speed out there times m that is going to be constant. So it is evident that no matter what your initial condition is this particle either will have a closed trajectory or will go on doing this so at some stage it will do this it will keep bouncing off and there would be an inner circle into which the particle can never come and outside like those thread work things you have seen with pins stuck on a board and then you have these envelope curves so this circle inside would form like an envelope curve but the problem is integrable.
it is solvable completely. So the circular stadium is solvable. Now you can play this game and ask what happens if you have an elliptic stadium. The next thing is to ask what happens if you have an elliptic stadium. So let us look at that and these are non-trivial problems really. So I have a particle moving in an elliptic stadium with two foci here. Do you think this is an integrable problem? Angular momentum about the center of the ellipse is not conserved. Definitely not because in this problem you do not have circular symmetry. The sum of the angular momenta with respect to each of the foci, this is conserved in this problem. So this stadium is also solvable this thing is solved. Okay. What happens if I do this? So another example and I do not want to number it because it is not something I am going to discuss now. I have a square stadium and I put a circular obstacle inside at the center. I am not allowed to go through into that. So it, whenever it hits the particle hits that obstacle it bounces off by the laws of reflection. Do you think this problem is solvable? It does not have Cartesian symmetry because this obstacle does not have Cartesian symmetry. It is got circular symmetry but then the boundary does not have circular symmetry. So there is a conflict here between circular symmetry and Cartesian symmetry. Do you think this problem is solvable? You need further information. This is not an integrable system. The simple looking thing is not an integrable system and let me tell you the mechanism by which chaos appears here. We are not going to discuss it in great detail right now and that is the following. What happens if the system is integrable is that we saw you could go to action angle variables. Now once you go to action angle variables we saw the actions remain constant and the angle variables increase linearly in time which means that if you start with two phase trajectories one of them here and one of them here with a neighboring initial condition the distance between these two can only increase linearly in time in the angle variable and when you go back to the original variables it would increase in some prescribed fashion some known fashion but the fact is errors do not amplify in this problem not exponentially anyway you just increase linearly. But in this problem a very simple physical consideration shows you can be in deep trouble because if I showed a particle at it like this it bounces back but I showed it, showed it a little bit to the right ever so little to the right and then the next time it does this and then it does this and then it does this etc. But ever so little to the left would cause it to take a totally different history etc. and this spreads out and any error in that initial angle can actually become as big as the system size itself. Any separation initially can become as big as the system itself due to the fact that this Cartesian symmetry is not commensurate with this circular symmetry here and there is a defocusing effect here and because of this this system becomes chaotic it is not predictable. There are lots of trajectories initial conditions for which you can predict things for example if I shoot it like this it would do this or if I shoot it in this fashion it would keep going in a trajectory of this kind no problem but there are sets of non-zero measure initial conditions for which the trajectory in future cannot be predicted it is not computable and this stadium has chaos. Now you might say oh this is very easy because every time you have something like this a defocusing effect like a convex lens you are in good shape you can immediately say this is going to defocus produce chaos. So to disabuse you of that notion let me point out that the following is going to happen. We saw that the square stadium was integrable and the circular stadium was integrable. So suppose I take a circular stadium I cut it in two and separate the two pieces and then I have a semicircle, a semicircle and then a straight segment here and a straight segment here. The slope at this point and the slope at this point there is no discontinuity but the curvature has a discontinuity because the straight line has 0 curvature and this has finite curvature. So this stadium a very famous one it is called the Bunimovich stadium 
and it has no convex surface it has two concave lenses here if you like concave mirrors here and then straight mirrors plane mirrors but this problem is also chaotic as long as this ratio of the straight line segment to the radius of the circle is non zero you have a chaotic behavior there is defocusing here in this problem and to give you an optics analogy the defocusing occurs not because of uh, the defocusing of a convex mirror but it occurs due to other optical aberrations so you could have astigmatism for instance and you could have spherical aberration so those effects could because this is like ray optics as you can see and that produces chaos in this problem here and then of course you can categorize various kinds of stadia to see which would produce chaos which won't and most of the time systems are chaotic so even two degree of freedom systems because the phase space is four dimensional there are four differential equations can produce chaos but these are sort of mathematical models let us go to physical models let us go and ask next what happens and that is going to be our example 5 I believe or 4 example 5 example 5 particle in a central potential. in three dimensions so now we are trying to look for physical problems and let us look at the physical problem of a particle in three dimensions moving in a central potential what is the Hamiltonian going to be it is the function of R and P and this is equal to the kinetic energy plus a potential V which is a function of little r alone no angular dependences so there are two cyclic coordinates here to start with in the potential there is no r dependent theta dependence no phi dependence but remember in p squared there is theta dependence so if I wrote this out in spherical polar coordinates this is p r squared over 2 m plus p theta squared plus p phi squared over sin squared theta over 2 m r squared plus v of r this is what you call the square of the angular momentum. So there is one constant of the motion how many degrees of freedom does this problem have three degrees of freedom so you need three constants of the motion in involution with each other to solve this problem what are they the Hamiltonian is one what are the others since it has circuit since it has spherical symmetry there is no torque on this particle therefore angular momentum is conserved so it looks like you have an h and you have the angular momentum itself l and that is got three constants of the motion in it l x l y and l z are they in involution with each other no unfortunately no so that is not true they are not in involution with each other so tell me do we have constants of the motion in involution you can choose one component what would you like to choose the z component the z component does not have to be any component so let us choose the z component so there is h there is lz lx ly are out because as soon as you choose this the other two are not in involution therefore you cannot choose that anything else anything else think of quantum mechanics in the hydrogen atom you have this principal quantum number you have the orbital angular momentum quantum number and you have this magnetic quantum number uh, quantum numbers are like the analogs of constants of the motion here in classical physics so what is the other constant of the motion yes l squared absolutely l squared h l z l vector squared this Poisson commutes with every component you know that l x l y l z do not commute with each other but each of them commutes with l squared and you have to choose any one of them now we have chosen l z purely out of convenience we could have chosen any other component could we have done this could we have chosen l dot some arbitrary unit vector n yes indeed yes any one direction in space you could have chosen that along with l squared so these three form three independent 
constants of the motion in involution with each other they are functionally independent of each other specifying two of them does not specify the third completely and therefore this problem is integrable. The central force problem is integrable in three dimensions. Notice I have not made use of the fact that this is of the form 1 over r it does not have to be every central force problem is integrable the 1 over r and the r squared potentials would be very special they have extra problem extra symmetries over and above this their trajectories would have very very special properties but in principle every central force problem in three dimensions a single particle is integrable. The rest is detail writing down the solution choosing the proper coordinates and the generalized momenta and so on. How about two particles interacting in the following way so that is example 6 two particle system and now I have h of r 1 r 2 p 1 and p 2 and let us suppose it is of the form p 1 squared over 2 m 1 plus p 2 squared over 2 m 2 plus a potential v which is a function of r 1 and r 2 in general arbitrary potential do you think this has this is integrable remember v is not a function of r 1 alone plus a function of r 2 alone then of course it is separable but it is an arbitrary function of both these vectors do you think this is integrable first of all what is n in this problem n is 6 you are in a 12 dimensional phase space and you need 6 constants of the motion we have one the Hamiltonian is angular momentum conserved no oh. about what the question you have to ask is about what yeah. what would you do to reduce this problem you would go to the center of mass coordinates you would go to you would go to a system where you would uh, change variables from r 1 r 2 to the center of mass and the relative coordinate. So, perhaps you do the following you would write r equal to m 1 r 1 plus m 2 r 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2 and little r equal to r 1 minus r 2 is this going to help is this going to help it is going to help here. So, what happens to this thing what happens to the kinetic energy if I do that well conjugate to this r you would have a total momentum p which is p 1 plus p 2 and conjugate to this you would have a relative momentum p which is equal to p 1 minus p 2 and then what happens to the kinetic energy you change variables to these guys and then what happens well there is certainly a contribution which is p squared over twice total momentum squared no not the reduced mass this is the total system moving yeah total mass m so we put m equal to m 1 plus m 2 okay. plus you see you cannot change the number of variables there is an r 1 and an r 2 and a p 1 and a p 2 now you got a little r and a big r and a little p and a big p that is it I mean you know what happens to the remaining terms this is p squared divided by twice capital M this is the relative momentum squared reduced mass right here this is the reduced mass too. So, these are simple exercises mu and how is the reduced mass defined m 1 m 2 divided by m 1 plus m 2. So, that part is fine plus what happens to v you should do these exercises at some stage you should take this you know change these variables plug it in see what happens 
what happens to v? It is some arbitrary function something else some u of little r and capital R there is nothing you can do about it that is it there is really nothing you can do about it in general. So would you say this problem is integrable? You have gone to the center of mass coordinates but it has not produced any particular simplification but, but suppose V of R1, comma R2, equal to a function of the distance R1 minus R2 alone. Suppose that's true. Then what happens? It instantly says this becomes V of R. Implies this. Is there a cyclic coordinate? What's that? capital R is a cyclic coordinate. So capital R implies capital R is a cyclic. What constancy of what constant of the motion does that yield at once? Capital P that says the entire center of mass moves either at constant speed forever or stays at rest depending on the initial condition and inside something is going on. So this immediately implies P is a C O M. Is this problem integrable? Would you say this problem is integrable? Well the Hamiltonian is a constant of the motion. P is a constant of the motion. So is it integrable? Why not? Why not? How many constants of the motion do you need now? Huh? Yeah, so you got six of them. See, this problem with the capital P is completely solvable. It's totally solved. Then you're left with this because this is like saying I have two decoupled Hamiltonians. One which involves the capital variables. One which involves the small variables, the relative variables. The capital variables are free particles. The center of mass acts like a free particle. And of course, you can solve it. It is immediately solved, it is just going to move at the straight line at constant speed, whatever be the initial speed, and that is the end of it. So, this is like reducing it into a decoupled system. This is done, it is finished. Then you are left with a single degree of freedom in three dimensions. So, three degrees of freedom here corresponding to little r's components, and now this problem here is a central force problem, which we saw is solved. So, the orbital angular momentum is a constant. So, that Hamiltonian together with the remaining two uh, the L squared the corresponding L squared and a single component is like a central force problem and it is solved. So this is solvable it is integrable as long as the potential is a function of the difference between the distance between the two particles it is solvable it is integrable completely because the two body problem is reduced to two one body problems one of which is free motion and the other is just simple central force problem. So this is very much integrable. Yes. Yeah. Right. So I'm going to leave it to you as an exercise to figure out where are the constants of the motion. You must check that they're in involution with each other. Six independent constants of the motion in involution. So the hint I'm giving you is that it's like two one particle problems, and this set of three coordinates and that set of three coordinates have nothing to do with each other anymore and therefore it is solvable completely. So this is very much integrable. Yes. 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 That is a vector yes. So this stands for P x, P 1 x, P 1 y, P 1 z etc. It is in moving in three dimensional space.
okay. I am not able to write bold face on the board, so I put an arrow, but then I put a square there, so I stands for p dot p, okay, which is a scalar. Good, so it is certainly a scalar, not a vent. Okay. So this is solved, but now suppose you have 3 particles. This is a very important problem because you have 3 particles and then let us assume that they are interacting each other with each other by gravitational force for example, which depends on the distance between the 2 particles. So what would you say is happening? Example 7. Let us in fact look at the n body problem. So we look at the n body. This Hamiltonian is a function of R1 to Rn, P1 to Pn and that is equal to a summation i equal to 1 to n Pi squared, let us put a bracket here, so 2mi that is the kinetic energy plus and now yeah. Yes, that is right. Pardon me, what is in a potential? Yes, no, the two particles experience potentials only due to each other, so there is no external potential added. This is a function of R1 and R2. If you like, you can add to this a constant potential that is not going to affect things, right. It might break the symmetry. Of course, if I add a gravitational field, it might break the symmetry, then you have a problem. So, you may not be able to write this anymore. But the assumption I made was that this is a set of particles interacting with each other by pairwise forces. In fact, in this case, just two of them, and the force is entirely a function of the two coordinates, of course. I assume no velocity dependent forces. Then that was not good enough. So I said the force between these two particles is derived from a potential, so it is a conservative force and that potential depends on the mutual distance between the particles, no non-central force here and that immediately gave me a scalar. It said this potential depends only on this distance here and that got reduced to a central force problem for the relative coordinates and therefore the problem was solvable. Now with this. Uh, with this uh, understanding that you know this problem is reduced in this fashion, I try to do the n body problem. So now let us assume I know that the n body problem with arbitrary forces is not integrable, even two, the two body problem is not. So let us assume that this potential here is V, which is a function of modulus Ri minus Rj summed over Ij equal to 1 to n and I not equal to j simply to ensure that I am not adding unnecessary terms which correspond to self interaction. Each point particle sees the forces due to all the other particles, but they are pairwise interactions. Particle 1 interacts with 2, 3, 4, etc. always depend on the distance between the given particle and the other particle. Now this system, are yeah. there any forces in uh, which the potential depends uh, on 3 particles rather than say. Excellent question. Are there true three body forces and the answer is yes, yes this is a hard problem. Nuclear physics this happens all the time and then of course this whole thing goes out of the window. So yes there are nonsense, there are three body, true genuine three body effects do occur. We can give probabilistic arguments about how often they would occur and so on but they do, they do happen. More, More per, yes, More than three. any number, yes this is possible. In principle yes it is possible an n body problem. In quantum physics this is quite routine, you would really have n body potentials. But there is also another possibility, the force between two particles need not depend on just the distance between them. It could also depend on the vectors R1 and R2. Can you give me a simple example of this, a simple example with which you are already familiar? Electromagnetism. Yes, in electromagnetism where even in electrostatics there is such a simple force. What happens if you got two point dipoles? electric dipoles P1 and P2, what happens to the potential energy between them? So you got a P1 here, I am sorry to use the word the, the symbol P1, let us call the electric dipole D1. 
so a little d1 here and a little d2 here and the distance between them is r so let's say this guy is at coordinate r1 and this is at coordinate r2 and what's the potential energy between these two dipoles they are point dipoles so you assume that the length of the dipole goes to 0 the charge goes to infinity so the product is at one point this is, is finite what is the potential energy yeah what what is the potential energy between two dipoles and study the electrostatics so there is certainly a term which is d1 dot d2 incidentally this must be a scalar it must depend on the distance between them and so on so d1 dot d2 divided by r12 cubed apart from 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught which is a matter of units so this is proportional to this term here it must linearly depend on d1 it must linearly depend on d2 so you got a d1 dot d2 over r cubed r12 cubed but that is not enough because I know that the force between two dipoles like this is different from the force between two dipoles like that so it cannot just depend on the distance can't just depend on the distance and certainly this force is different from that force so what's the next term there's also a term which is 3 d1 dot r1 d2 ah d1 dot r d2 dot r over let me just call r let's call this vector r the difference between the two and what is the power here out of the 5 because I put two factors here so you see this depends on the relative orientation of the vector r the distance between these two the, the vector joining one to the other with d1 and d2 it must be symmetric under the interchange of d1 and d2 it must be linear in d1 linear in d2 and you got three vectors to play with d1 d2 and r it cannot depend on the overall origin but only on r so these are the only possibilities so it is linear dependence and incidentally it should be the same whether you take r to minus r or not because whether you call r the vector going from dipole 1 to 2 or 2 to 1 does not matter and that 2 is preserved here this is not a central force yeah. Yeah. Well now it is a question of you know it is a question of resolution if I have an atom then on distances much larger than the atom it would certainly have a dipole could have a dipole moment or a magnetic dipole moment right. So it is not a question of whether something exists physically or not I know for instance if I have an arbitrary charge distribution I could resolve it the potential due to this from as if you had an effective monopole and then a dipole and a quadrupole and so on and so forth right? it is just a resolution into spherically uh, into components whose transformation properties and the rotations are known to me okay. yeah, it is a question of approximation right I mean a ceiling fan is a dipole in some approximation right because what do the force lines due to a fan uh, due to a dipole look like they come out like this and they go back in this fashion is not it this is what uh, dipole force is going to look like the field lines are going to look like this. they go out this way and they come in this way so you could imagine the center of a ceiling fan it is sucking in air from above and pushing it through and then going back so in some approximation it is really like a dipole source of a velocity field okay. all right so this is a non central this is an example of a non central force but our interest now is in trying to find out whether this problem is solvable or not because now we have made all the assumptions we need we have said you have got n particles and they see forces only due to each other and the force between any pair of particles is dependent only on the distance between them it is directed along the line joining these two particles so that is a scalar v of mod r i minus r j is scalar and this whole thing is spherically symmetrical in the sense that if I rotate the coordinate system mod r i minus r j does not change therefore the potential does not change so it has spherical symmetry 
this is would you say this is integrable? In the two body case it was, but in the three body case let us write down all the constants of the motion that we can write down. Huh? So, C O m s the first one is a Hamilton in itself and the second one would be the total angular momentum of the system that is certainly a constant of the motion. What is the total angular momentum? Summation over i equal to 1 to n r i cross p i r cross p is the angular momentum for each particle the orbital angular momentum about some origin incidentally this Hamiltonian is invariant under shift of the origin because it only depends on the distances. So, you can choose the overall origin wherever you like and certainly L equal to r cross p is a constant of the motion. There are three constants of the motion there, three components. Anything else? Anything else is a constant of the motion? How about the total momentum of the system? Is that that is a constant, there is no external force. So, that is certainly a constant, right? Generalization of Newton's third law, the total momentum, because there is no external force on the system. So, three capital P equal to summation i equal to 1 to n P i that is a constant of the motion. How many do we have now? We got 1 plus 3 4 plus 3 7 what is the little n equal to yeah pardon me. No then oh a very good point. I am only labeling now right now I am only listing the constants of motion after that we got to examine how many of them are going to be in involution with each other yeah. So, that is for integrability you need that, but what is n equal to 3 n okay, we keep that at the back of our minds we found a grand total of 7 so far anything else anything else. What about you see I know this guy I know this is a constant of the motion and therefore, I know that r of t equal to r of 0 plus p t over m. I certainly know that I know the center of mass of this entire system is going to move at uniform speed hmm, at constant velocity simply because there is no external force on it and that depends on the initial condition. So, are there constants of the motion there? Yeah, there are. So, we have 4 r minus p t over m. They are time dependent, but then we yesterday we saw that we could have time dependent constants of the motion. How many are there now? 10. They call the 10 Galilean constants of the motion, the Galilean invariants. In the absence of further information that is it there is really nothing else you can do. Now, we still have to worry about her problem which is how many of them are going to be in involution with each other it is clear the three components of L are not in involution with each other they have to be in involution with each other and with the Hamiltonian of course each of them is in involution with the Hamiltonian as a constant of the motion. This the three components of p they would certainly mean involution with everything p with l is not true immediately it is gone. In any case you need 3 n constants of the motion before you can talk of integrability and you have a grand total of 10 and even they are not in involution with each other. For n equal to 3 the three body problem you need 9 constants of the motion and you are far below that even for 3 particles. Let us forget about 10 to the 23 particles. So, the system is badly chaotic even the 3 body problem is not integrable except in very special cases and of course, you have 10 to the 23 particles is gone. 
we saw in fact that if you have a single particle inside a stadium with a fixed scatterer which has got a different symmetry in two dimensions even that is chaotic. So, certainly what is happening to the gas in this room is highly chaotic there is no possibility of solving it. So, the reason why you need statistical mechanics partly is not just that you have 10 to the 23 particles and even God cannot write all those equations down, but even if you had 3 particles the situation is bad enough it is gone it cannot be integrated in general yeah. Uh, that is a very good question how do I know I found out everything experience <laughs> okay <laughs> no, it is possible to find out yeah you can we can make further statements the, the point is it is a very good question because we have to ask where are these constants of the motion coming from what do they represent uh, and the answer lies in Noether's theorem which I am going to do tomorrow mention this there is a constant of the motion associated with the symmetry of the system always a symmetry we saw if it is got spherical symmetry or circular symmetry it had angular momentum as a constant of the motion. So, symmetry is going to imply invariance which is going to imply a conservation principle or a conservation law and that is going to give you conserved quantities. So, this is where the constant of the motion come from and then you have to ask what is the symmetry of this Hamiltonian and the most general Hamiltonian does not have any much more symmetry than spherical symmetry overall that is it. So, really you cannot do much more. So, we have to now go back and ask what do simple Hamiltonians look like what kind of symmetry do they have and then can we take a lesson from that and see what happens in the general case. So, we now backtrack and let us go back to a problem which we can solve completely which is integrable and look at what its symmetry is and how that symmetry can be broken and the simplest of these examples is to go back and look at two simple harmonic oscillators because one simple harmonic oscillator is doable completely. So, now let us go back and look at the 2D oscillator and by that I mean a situation in which H of Q1, Q2, P1, P2 is just two linear harmonic oscillators uncoupled to each other. So, you could regard this as a single oscillator which has got a force in both the x and y directions or you could regard it as two simple harmonic oscillators uncoupled from each other does not matter. So, let me write this as H 1 of Q 1 P 1 plus H 2 of Q 2 P 2 and let us simplify things a little bit by saying this is equal to 1 over 2 m p 1 squared let us write it out p 1 squared over 2 m plus 1 half m omega 1 squared q 1 squared plus I know that the actual property of an oscillator is basically the ratio of the spring constant to the mass that is the relevant parameter the frequency. And so, let me call the frequency omega 1 and let us take the second oscillator to have the same mass, but perhaps a different frequency. this fashion. I can go to action angle variables this problem is totally solvable we know this is an independent oscillator that is an independent oscillator and each of them has a phase trajectory in its q p plane it is an ellipse of some kind, but the real system has four a four dimensional phase space and all we can do we cannot draw the phase trajectories because I cannot draw four dimensions, but I can draw projections of this phase trajectory onto various planes. So, I could do the following we will start by saying asking what happens in the q 1 q p 1 plane. So, here is q 1 p 1 and what happens in the q 2 p 2 plane. Well, this guy would go around in this fashion and this fellow would also go around in this fashion at any given instant of time you are on some point on this ellipse and some point on that ellipse and they need not be in phase these two oscillators need not be in phase at all good. This problem is solvable I could if with a little bit of effort draw the trajectory in the P 1 Q 2 plane Q 2 P 1 plane 
and so on q 1 q 2 plane and so on and so forth. What do you call the trajectory drawn in the q 1 q 2 plane? Lissajous figures they are two oscillators you could regard them as right angles they are like Lissajous figures okay. Now we have got sophisticated we are not going to look at it in these coordinates we know I can we can go to action angle variables uh, and this action angle variables I define so from here I go to an I 1 a theta 1 I 1 and from here I go to a theta 2 I 2 and I know that I 1 and I 2 are constants therefore let us just look at it as a function of theta 1 theta 2 right. What would they look like? What would the space look like? Well to describe theta 1 I would like to take an angle and to describe theta 2 I take another angle and the space is the space which is the direct product of two circles if you like and that is a two dimensional torus. So let us draw this torus in this fashion and as I move along this tube in this direction I talk say it is theta 1 and as I move in the transverse direction I call it theta 2 and the point the phase space point oh you could go a little further you could say let us take the diameter the radius of this tube to be proportional to I2 and the radius of this guy to be proportional to I1. So you can see this entire four dimensional space is laminated by these tori and each torus specifies what I1 and I2 are and the motion on the I1 direction has the time period 2 pi over omega 1 and the other direction has 2 pi over omega 2 right. Now tell me what would the trajectory look like in general suppose suppose omega 1 equal to omega 2 the simplest case then it means that as the representative point moves once around in this direction it moves once in this direction also so it sort of winds around and comes back to it and what does the Lissajous figure look like if this is the amplitude in the two direction and that is the amplitude in the one direction what would the Lissajous figure look like in general in general this would be a periodic curve right it closes every time it goes so what would it look like well if these two fellows are in phase then of course it would just do this but if they are not in phase then in general it would be an ellipse of some kind if they are exactly 90 degrees out of phase it would be an ellipse of this kind if there is some arbitrary angle out of phase it would be an ellipse of this kind etc. This is when the two frequencies are equal is the motion periodic yes it is periodic what if one frequency is twice another frequency what if omega 1 equal to twice omega 2. Then it says as the system goes around here once this it makes two curves on this side but it would do I cannot draw this too well but it do some crazy thing but it would come back to the same point and the Lissajou figure in this case again very imperfectly drawing it very imperfectly could perhaps do something like this like a figure of 8 but it would close on itself what if omega 1 over omega 2 is a rational number p times omega 1 is q times omega 2 or r and s for example in r times omega 1 is s times omega 2 where r and s are integers then again the Lissajous figure gets more complicated but it closes on itself what if the frequency ratio is irrational what happens then then you see you might have seen these Lissajous figures they densely fill up this rectangle and the system never returns to its original point no matter where you start. So it is periodic in q1 in q1 p1 periodic in q2 p2 but the two periods are not commensurate with each other. So therefore the phase trajectory on this torus will never close will never close it will be like a ball of thread going round and round on top of this but never coming back to its original point and we can simplify matters a little bit by like by saying 
well let us write this Hamiltonian as P1 squared plus over 2m plus half m q uh, so let us put P1 squared over 2m plus half m I put omega 1 equal to 1 so q1 squared plus p2 squared over 2m plus half m omega squared q2 squared and this is an irrational number if the ratio of frequencies is irrational omega is irrational then this Hamiltonian is integrable it is completely solvable just the sum of two oscillators but on this torus the trajectory does not close would you say this is periodic motion because for me periodic motion is when all the phase space variables come back to their original values after a finite amount of time. So the motion is said to be quasi periodic it is not periodic in general so omega irrational omega 1 by omega 2 irrational implies quasi periodic motion. and it has strange properties and you could do the following you could say let me set this frequency equal to 1 and look at it as a function of this second angle. So I put a cross section here and this cross section is called a Poincare section is an example of a Poincare section and now I ask when does the trajectory hit this circle so what is happening is that it is going round and round and every time it hits the circle I note it down and therefore that circle if I look at it separately it started here then it went round in the other direction it came back here and then it went round in the other direction it came back somewhere here and so on this is like saying each time you add an irrational number if this has unit circumference you are adding an irrational number to this circle hmm. of course if you add a rational number then every point will come back to itself after a certain amount of time but if you add an irrational number then there is a theorem due to Weierstrass which says that if you take a unit circle circle of unit circumference add an irrational number so what are you doing you are saying theta n plus 1 equal to theta n plus an irrational number omega modulo 1 modulo 2 pi or 1 it does not matter the circumference you put modulo 1 and this is irrational modulo 1 means you remove the integer and you come back so you start here and then you go here you go here and you keep going this you never come back to this point you will overshoot or undershoot it and then it does this and so on and what happens is that this point of intersection given enough time will fill up the entire circle densely and uniformly no particular point on it is preferred over anything else and this trajectory on the two dimensional torus will fill up eventually any initial condition will eventually fill up this entire torus and the system is now said to be quasi periodic and since any initial point visits the neighborhood of the entire torus the system is said to be ergodic on the torus you are adding an irrational number I do not care what theta is it does not matter it does not matter it's good. any theta so do this experiment on the pocket calculator on a simple computer hmm? you cannot add an irrational number because you will always end with a finite precision on your computer so you really cannot add an irrational number so what would you do what would you do this is a simple problem start with the number theta naught between 0 and 1 it does not matter any number add to it an irrational number throw away the integer and keep doing this and keep track of all the iterates and you will discover that they form a histogram in the units uh, on the unit interval which is uniform completely uniform never comes back but now I leave it to you as a problem as to how you would add an irrational number on a computer 
because any number you specify on the computer would be a rational number the term it terminates after a certain stage right the decimal points terminate after a certain stage. So what would you do pardon me uh, you have finite precision and this now leads us into very subtle questions you should try and add as irrational a number as possible you should add a number which will be rational eventually but as irrational as possible by that I mean the periodicity would be very large in other words if you express this number as a fraction if you express it completely as a fraction exactly you are gone but the best approximation to this would be should be a fraction with a very large denominator then of course you know the period is very very long if the period is 25,642 then you do not really care in a finite amount of time huh? so you should try to add a number which is very very got a very very large uh, it is very irrational square root of 2 minus 1 a good number for a reason I will explain later on okay. A square root of 5 minus 1 divided by 2 this is a very good number to add. Hmm? So I wanted to say that it becomes ergodic. By that I meant that any initial condition is going to visit arbitrarily close to every other point on the torus infinitely often as you keep going and with equal frequency with equally often. No, no, no it is a unit circle so otherwise you write modulo 2 pi okay. add an irrational number. So that is why I said 1 because otherwise it is 2 pi mod irrational modulo 2 pi which becomes so, so I take a unit circumference and this is a very remarkable theorem that it has this magic property and you see how number theory is getting into this whole game you see how the properties of irrational numbers rational numbers are getting into this game so you should remember what irrational numbers are they are numbers that cannot have a decimal expansion which terminates or recurs or if you like they are numbers which cannot be expressed as a ratio of 2 integers p over q where uh, p and q, q is not 0 yeah pardon me what was that it is like choosing 1 twice I am saying add an irrational number I said I chose the circumference to be equal to 1 rather than 2 pi. So in his question would be equivalent to saying what happens if I add 1 then of course you are back but 1 is not irrational so you got to choose an irrational number between 0 and 1 number which is an element of this uh, range between 0 and 1 so do not choose 0 or 0 1 that of course is trivial. 0 is the identity map it does not do anything and 1 is also the identity map it says every point goes back to itself right. But any number in between you will see there are no periodic orbits there are no exceptions there are no numbers which will come back to themselves no initial conditions will come back to itself. Now in general therefore if I have an n dimensional system n oscillators the same thing would happen and the big lesson is that if I take a general Hamiltonian system and the system is integrable the motion in general is quasi periodic bounded motion is in general quasi periodic but the big difference between the harmonic oscillator and the general system is that the time period of oscillation would depend on the energy or the amplitude or the action variables whereas in this problem the frequency of going around does not depend on the size of this torus does not depend on the action variable but in the general case of course there would be non-linearity then it would depend on the size and then now you have to start imagining I have this n dimensional phase space two n dimensional phase space in which I have n dimensional tori. So the question is what happens in between the tori if the system is fully integrable then every point is on a torus but if it is not there are regions of chaotic, chaotic behavior in between and then the next question is can these regions escape and this will again require a little bit of higher dimensional imagination but it is not so difficult we 
come to that when we do this uh, when, we, when we get to it okay so let me stop here <laughs>